Hi, so I'm Toby Wiseman from uh, Imperial College. I'm in the theoretical physics group there. And um, it's my privilege to give this uh, lecture, although unfortunately not in person, um, as part of the Time uh, and Eternal Life exhibit, which is a beautiful exhibit at the very wonderful new Cromwell Place Gallery just down the road from where I work at Imperial College, um, although I'm not there currently. So uh, we're in the second lockdown at the moment and so uh, sadly I'm recording this remotely. I did have the wonderful opportunity between the first lockdown and the second lockdown to go and see the new Cromwell Place and this beautiful uh, exhibit on, um, on, on time and uh, our understanding of time. And what I hope to do in this lecture is give a modern perspective from the point of view of physics, fundamental theoretical physics, on how we understand space and time. Now, I should say right from the outset, and, and this is one of the things I find most interesting about, uh, about this exhibit, is that as theoretical physicists, uh, we are interested in how to describe the physical reality of space and time in the scientific sense, using the scientific method. And that is a very, very different thing to how I, I, I understand an artist would approach time, uh, which is very much from the human experience. We are really complete opposite ends of, of this human endeavour of understanding our place in, in the universe. Uh, we're trying to abstract ourselves from that picture as, as scientists and try and get at what we view as the, the fundamental laws that govern everything without uh, the messy us in between. But I think the interface of the two is, is really fascinating. And of course, at the end of the day, as humans, what we're, what we're, what we're doing always in, in, in however we approach uh, time, space and so on, the universe, it's always a process of uh, trying to understand and it's driven generally by curiosity uh, and the, the wonderful curiosity that humans have, have has uh, taken us to these incredible places and I, I hope to describe some of the progress where uh, hu human curiosity over thousands of years uh, has enabled us to unlock what we think of as the most sort of beautiful laws underlying nature. Anyway, let me, let me get on. I can tell you about space and time and much of that picture starts with the sort of classical work of Newton and then I'm going to go on and talk about more modern things and by modern I mean just a hundred years old uh, with the work of Einstein, um, the special relativity and the remarkable quantum mechanics that also came around at the turn of the last century. After that we move on to the next phase of Einstein which is what we call general relativity and this is an incredible uh, sort of paradigm shift in our understanding of space and time and uh, towards the end of the lecture I hope I'll tell you a little bit about uh, some really modern ideas which are quite speculative but uh, I, but I feel like I should I should bring us right up to date as we're as we're going through chronologically so let's begin with the classical era of space and time um, time I think has always been intuitively understood as a as a continuum, you know, there's a notion of a flow of time and it's very close to our perception of time that we sort of exist at an instant of time and, and progress through. Space is a little bit more subtle and um, classically space of course was understood as a continuum but trying to describe that uh, was really one of the tasks that the, the Greek philosophers and mathematicians undertook and they worried a lot about whether even motion through a continuum could be thought of as real. This is Zeno. So Zeno has a famous paradox. Zeno thought of moving from one column to another, uh, Ionic to Doric, or perhaps the other way around, I, uh, I have to confess I can't remember. Um, Zeno moves halfway. So uh, Zeno moves in steps of a half, so he goes halfway across, and then he moves halfway again, the remaining distance, halfway again of the remaining distance, and again. And Zeno quickly comes to the conclusion that it's going to take an infinite number of steps, taking these half, half remaining distance steps, 
to reach the, room, the, the second column. Now, that's very concerning because Zeno then realizes that there's an infinite number of processes to go through to move from this one column to another. Now, of course, we as humans experience motion from one place to another, but the Greeks then worried deeply about whether this was real, whether there really was a reality of motion through a continuum or whether it was just illusionary to us. Now, the Greeks were absolutely brilliant and started thinking about these ideas and then much later on, um, mathematicians formalized how to think of a continuum. We understand the numbers as a continuum in particular, and it was the brilliance of Descartes uh, who came up with what we now call Cartesian coordinates, which are the notion that you can identify the points in the real number line, the real numbers that we know and love, with space, so as coordinates. Now, of course, today it's completely obvious. We have maps, you want to know where you are, you, you, you look up your GPS coordinates and so on. But in those days, this idea of using analytical tools to describe geometry and space was revolutionary and opened up this incredible new understanding that you could use mathematics to describe space and also, of course, time. Now, Newton then came along and Newton really is the, a key figure in the development of modern theoretical physics, our understanding fundamentally of the universe. It, it can't be under, overstated how significant his contribution was. So firstly, Newton gave us calculus, which is the way to understand the laws that he then came up with uh, in, in mathematical terms. And then he gave us the laws to understand how objects move, what governs their motion. For Newton, time and space are a stage, a, an absolute stage on which uh, the mechanics of the world plays out. Uh, here's a, a rocket. It follows a trajectory in space through time. And Newton's famous F equals MA, his famous law, and I have to apologize, I am unashamedly, unashamedly going to put in some mathematics into this talk. I think uh, you can't give a theoretical physics talk without a few equations. I don't expect uh, a, a, a non-physics audience to understand the equations, but I think they look nice and um, I do feel they should be there. Anyway, here's F equals MA. Um, and this is a remarkable expression because what it, what it tells us is that if we can understand the forces acting on an object, it allows us to predict, predict in detail mathematically where the object will be later. And of course, Newton also understood things like the force of gravity. And so using that can understand the celestial motion of the planets sort of in, in one fell swoop. I mean, absolutely remarkable progress. But the key observation, and this is the key brilliance of Newton, is that really he formalized the idea that the universe is mathematical. At a fundamental level, how the universe works is maths, and it's simple maths, it's simple equations, and it's that process of chipping away at what the fundamental equations are, the most fundamental equations we can get to, that is the subject of theoretical fundamental physics these days. And we've got a long way, and I hope to describe some of that, um, there's probably much more to discover. But it is a remarkable fact that maths underpins our universe at the most fundamental level, and it's also a remarkable fact that no one knows why. Uh, anyone who tells you they know why almost certainly doesn't. Uh, it, is, it is just a strange and um, sort of metaphysical fact, uh, and very beautiful, because without it we would stand very little chance, I think, of understanding how things work, with it, with this process of discovering this math that seems to underlie all physical processes, we have a chance of maybe even one day getting to the true answer, if there is such a thing, we just don't know. But it's, it's the endeavor that people like Einstein, you know, more recently Hawking, all the famous uh, names that we've heard of have, have given us uh, a progress in. Now, 
Moving from this classical era to a more modern era, we come to Einstein's work of special relativity and a notion that space and time shouldn't be thought of as distinct from each other. So Einstein in 1905 tells us that everyone agrees on the speed of light. Nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. It's, it's a universal speed limit. But the key point is that everyone agrees on it. It is a, a, an absolutely remarkable fact that um, hundreds of years before, people had appreciated that the speed of light was finite and had actually measured its speed by looking at the moons of Jupiter. It is unbelievable how clever people were. Uh, it is a, it's such a misconception to think we are cleverer than people were hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago, you know, going back way further. Uh, they were absolutely brilliant. Uh, this measurement of the speed of light from the moons of Jupiter is just unbelievable. Of course, they were limited by technology, but it, it was pure brilliance. Um, what Einstein did, however, that was fabulous, was to say not that the speed of light was finite, but that whoever measured it, whatever they were doing, would measure the same speed and exactly the same speed. So this speed is absolute. Now, imagine you're in a car. You're looking out of the window on the motorway and you look at your neighboring car. Uh, now, you will see a very small relative speed difference, hopefully. And that is why motorways are a safe form of transport. On the other hand, if you look out on a single carriageway road at a car coming the other way, you will see that car approaching at a very high relative speed to you. Okay, Now, that is why they introduced a uh, dual carriageway, uh, or, or rather the, the central reservation, uh, because, of course, uh, it's much safer, because the relative speeds are so much less. Now, supposing a light ray passed in the opposite uh, carriageway of your single carriageway road, you would see it approach you at a speed uh, that you would have thought was greater than if it passed you in the same direction, if it overtook you. You would imagine that something like 60 miles an hour twice, 120 miles an hour or so, depending if you're, if you're doing that speed, would be the difference that you would measure the relative speed of light in those two situations uh, to be. So is that right? Well, Einstein says no. In both those situations, you would measure the speed of light to be exactly the same, even though in one case you're approaching the speed of light, you're, you're approaching the light beam, and in the other case you're driving in the direction with it. There will be no difference in how you perceive uh, or measure the speed of light. Now, how can that be? Because for any normal terrestrial uh, sort of measurement of speed, of course, the relative speed you see will definitely depend on your motion. Um, Einstein says, well, actually, once you get to large speeds, and of course the speed of light is very large, something like a billion miles an hour, interestingly, um, once you uh, get to very large speeds, space and time don't behave uh, as separate entities. Speed is distance over time, and if you always measure speed to have uh, the speed of light to be exactly the same, Distance and time have to be related uh, in, in a sort of subtle way. They become inextricably linked. And that was Einstein's observation, that space and time are not distinct. They're linked into something we call space-time. I had a, a brilliant lecturer when I was an undergraduate who always said space-time very loudly, very energetically. But the emphasis is that these two seemingly completely distinct uh, facets of, of reality are basically part and parcel of the same thing. Space-time is uh, one object and different people moving in different ways will perceive space and time differently, but that perception is always such that whenever anyone comes to measure the speed of light, they always measure exactly the same speed. Space-time is the collection of all events. What is an event? An event is something that happens somewhere at some time. We can give coordinates to events, we can give a time, we can give a position, uh, position or coordinates, but different people will label, depending on their motion, different events in different ways. It doesn't matter. They're just labels. Uh, what is fundamental 
is not these labels, but the, the collection of all of the, the, the events themselves, the space-time. And in fact, in, in Einstein's theory, time and distances, instead of being fundamental to uh, two events, for example, the, the time between two events or distance between two events, they rather become properties uh, to do with how those uh, distances are observed by uh, observers. It, they become properties of the trajectories that we take through space and time. So an example is the following. Supposing I'm starting at Cromwell Place at uh, 11.35, uh, having seen this brilliant gallery, and then I'm toddling back to Imperial College, um, uh, but I have a, a compatriot who is social distancing from me, and uh, also leaves Cromwell Place at exactly the same time, and reaches Imperial College at exactly the same time, but because we're social distancing, we take a different route. And so we might then plot our trajectories in space and time in this way. Here we are, so we start at the same time, the same place, so the same event, Cromwell Place at 11.35, we end at the same event, Imperial College, at 11.50, but our routes through space are different as time progresses. Now, Einstein says, space and time, they're just labels. So whilst it looks like, um, let's see, 11.50 minus 11.35, 15 minutes uh, have elapsed, um, whilst it looks like 15 minutes have elapsed, uh, in fact, that's not really what's happened. That 15 minutes is just uh, a number associated to the labels. There's nothing physical about it. The amount of time we actually will perceive to have elapsed will depend on our path through space and time. And because we've taken a different path through space and time, myself and my socially distanced uh, friend, we will see different times to have elapsed. These are called our proper times. The 15 minutes is meaningless. What matters is the time really that we physically observe, which is this proper time. And we will see different times. Of course, because we're traveling at low speeds, that will be very close to 15 minutes. But uh, it is, it will be different and this is real physics. This has been measured. You can put atomic clocks on airplanes, um, fly them around for a bit, bring them, bring them back and compare them to an atomic clock that's just been sitting in the lab and you can measure the difference in time because the path taken uh, between the two events, starting in the lab and finishing in the lab, has been different. Okay, so this is real, absolutely real physics. And it leads to the notion, remarkably, of time travel. I mean, this isn't, I think, commonly ex uh, understood in modern culture that time travel is really possible. There's a so-called famous twins paradox in special relativity. Uh, it's, it's called a paradox which sort of implies that there's a, there's a problem, something's wrong, uh, but in fact it's, it's not a paradox at all, it's a physical reality. It is just the notion that time, the time you experience depends on your path through space and time. So there's this uh, sort of classic idea that two twins start on Earth, one gets in their space rocket, blasts off into space for a long time, blasts back and is travelling very fast, and comes back and they are then younger than their twin. And this isn't a paradox at all, it's just true, it's just how physics is. And the reason is simply the same as, as, as the reason that uh, the two people travelling between these events, myself, my socially distanced friend, uh, will experience different times. The, the faster you travel, the bigger the difference in time, and that's uh, sort of what this twins paradox is depicting. So whenever you're moving, whenever you're walking, whenever, strictly speaking, you're accelerating, you are time traveling relative to your compatriots who perhaps are accelerating in different ways. In fact, the more you accelerate, the younger you will keep yourself, although it is a, it is a rather small effect. So. Um, maybe taking your vitamins is going to be uh, more successful uh, in terms of a real uh, extension of your, uh, of your life. By the way, uh, I should just emphasize, um, this doesn't, ex you know, the, the younger traveler here hasn't extended their life. They have just, uh, it, it, less time has elapsed for them between the two events. So they haven't experienced more time. They have just, uh, their, their clock has just uh, ticked less than the, their older twin. 
So it, they haven't really gained, they've travelled into the future of the people who remained here on this planet Earth, presumably. Okay. Now quantum mechanics came along, and if you think what I've just been talking about is, is, is uh, pretty far out, quantum mechanics is, is far stranger, but actually interestingly doesn't tell us, uh, it doesn't change our notions of space and time so much, it changes our notion of mechanics, how things move dramatically and that's a subject of a whole different lecture and so I don't really want to go down that route because it's not to do with uh, space and time particularly it's really to do with what motion is. Uh, here's Schrodinger, uh, here's Schrodinger's uh, cat and what Schrodinger said is um, mechanics isn't as Newton thought this this notion that objects follow this deterministic trajectory through space and time isn't right when you look at quantum objects. So objects typically on small scales, you get a, a very different picture than Newton, which becomes Newton's picture when you look at very large objects. The quantum effects become smaller and smaller and smaller as the object becomes larger. Um, so instead of this well-defined trajectory through space and time, Schrodinger says actually there's a sort of fuzzy trajectory through space and time. You can't know where an object is um, uh, with any certainty. There is a so-called uncertainty principle. There's a, a new fundamental constant of nature that governs how uncertain things are. And then interestingly, when you combine the uncertainty principle, which basically tells you you can't know where something is and how fast it's moving, uh, you can't know both of those things. Uh, and, and there's a fundamental limit. You can know one of them very well, but then you don't know the other. Uh, so I might know the position of something very well, but not the speed, or I might know the speed of something very well, but not the position. And it's a fundamental thing. You can't change it. There's no way around it. There's no cleverer measurement you can make. But combined, interestingly, with special relativity, which says, well, actually, nothing can travel faster than the speed of light, we then already do know something about the speed. We know the speed, we can't be certain of it, but we can be certain it can't be greater than the speed of light, and that actually puts a bound on how well we can know where something is. Because we have always had this knowledge that it can't be travelling faster than the speed of light, it tells us that we actually can't know where something is to better than a certain precision. And, and this expression, this mathematical expression, tells us roughly that we can't know where something is uh, greater than, um, let me see, this formula here, this beautiful formula here, the more massive the object, the bigger the mass m, uh, the better you can know where you are. The more quantum the object, the lighter it is, the less fundamentally you can pin it down. Now, of course, for us, we're uh, I speak, speak for myself here, I'm very massive, and so this really isn't a big deal. But if you start thinking about small particles like atoms, electrons in atoms, this is, a, this is an important effect. Uh, this is a real thing. This, the little fluffy uh, electrons travel around the nucleus of an atom here, say a hydrogen atom, and if you calculate, um, uh, you know, they don't look like a deterministic particle here, like in the sense of Newton, they look like a sort of fuzzy cloud of, uh, you can't pin down where they are, and that's quantum mechanics, but fundamentally, even if you could, you know, even if you tried to pin it down as well as you could, uh, there's this fundamental limit, which actually isn't much smaller than the size of an atom, interestingly. So what have we learned? Space-time is a collection of all possible events. It's absolute. Space-time is absolute. But the way we label events with time and space is actually uh, is not has no physical significance. Time or space as we perceive it depends actually on our trajectory through space and time. And in fact, the position of an object, because of quantum mechanics and because of the speed limit of uh, light, becomes fundamentally un uncertain. You can't tell where an object is to a, a, a better um, degree of precision than this fundamental limit. Um, now, when we combine special relativity and quantum mechanics, we get our modern understanding of matter, which is called quantum field theory, and it's an incredibly beautiful subject. 
the standard model of particle physics that is tested at, um, for example, CERN in uh, Geneva by banging together um, subatomic particles and seeing what comes out, we understand this to an incredibly, uh, incredibly high precision. I mean, it's one of the most beautiful and well-tested physical theories that we have. It's really remarkable. And the most remarkable thing about it, it's called the standard model, which is probably the most boring name you could give to uh, at the pinnacle of human understanding in terms of um, what matter, what physical reality is at a scientific fundamental level, it's actually something you can write on a t-shirt. So th this is a t-shirt with it written on. This is the mathematics. You have to know a bit of maths to understand what this is saying, but fundamentally you can write it down in this very compact form on a t-shirt. And that t-shirt is telling us everything we know about how matter works. All the fundamental forces, all the matter, everything we're made of, everything out in our universe is written down in that t-shirt. There, there's a couple of things, dark matter, dark energy, that aren't in there, but pretty much everything else is there. And that's astonishing. So when we say the universe is written in this mathematical language, I mean, it's an incredibly beautiful mathematical language. I mean, how could you describe at a fundamental level all of matter in one equation? Remarkable. Anyway, now what about gravity? Now, now we have to come to gravity. So th this is understanding matter, and I'm, I'm making a distinction with gravity. Gravity is slightly different. It's another force. Of course, Newton understood the force of gravity. This, this famous uh, F um, is... Uh, G M M over R squared, you may have seen at school. Uh, and, it, and Newton understood this force between celestial objects. Um, he also understood that there were some problems with it. Uh, for example, in Newton's um, depiction of the force of gravity, the force seems to act instantaneously, which even Newton thought was a bit suspect. How can a force know to act instantaneously? If the sun jumped to the left, uh, um, light actually takes eight minutes to reach us. So Einstein would say, well, we can't possibly feel any gravitational effect of the, the sun suddenly jumping for eight minutes. But in, in Newton's theory, it would happen instantaneously. And Galileo observed a long time ago the very strange feature of uh, Newton's law of gravity, which is all objects fall the same way in the absence of air resistance. And that's peculiar. It doesn't matter what their mass is, doesn't, what they're, doesn't matter what they're made of. If they're made of lead, if they're made of, uh, well, he didn't have plastic, but uh, brick or something else, they all fall the same way. It's this uh, probably apocryphal story of um, uh, uh, Galileo dropping different things off the Tower of Pisa. I'm sure he didn't do that. But anyway, um, you know, qu quite remarkable. Now, it takes a brilliant mind to see that that's a strange thing to observe, and it doesn't happen with other forces. And it really begs a reason why. Why is it that all things fall the same way? Of course, they fall the same way because of Newton's law of gravity and Newton's uh, F equals ma force law, and the mass of the object um, cancels out when you when you do the calculations and that's why they fall the same way but why should it cancel it's a strange thing the mass of objects don't cancel for other forces what's special about gravity and so einstein in uh, 1915 came up with i think the most beautiful physical theory which is general relativity and this is our most fundamental understanding or at least uh, without quantum mechanics of gravity and he had the most I mean, it was an outlandish idea there's no force of gravity, but rather than the space-time we inhabit having a simple form, what we call flat, uh, it isn't. It has a complicated form and it's dynamical. And we move in straight lines through space-time. And so moving in straight lines, unless a force acts on you, is one of Newton's fundamental laws, and Einstein agreed with it. He said, if there's no force acting on you, you do move in a straight line through space-time. However, space-time doesn't have the flat, simple geometry that we imagine it has, and so this straight line that we're moving through, you know, along 
doesn't follow the, the simple path that we would think. So in Einstein's way of thinking, it's absolutely beautiful. There's no force of gravity at all. Rather, space-time take a more complicated form. We still travel in straight lines if no force, no other force is acting on us. Gravity isn't a force now. There's no force of gravity. We just move in a straight line. And our trajectory is a, is a strange trajectory. It looks like some force has acted on us. Uh, because space and time have this non-trivial structure. And all objects move the same way. Why? Because a straight line is a straight line. It doesn't matter what you're made of. If you follow a straight line, it's the same straight line. And this is essentially his what's called the equivalence principle. Let me illustrate this. It's a, it's a very strange idea, but it's, it's actually not as uh, complicated to understand as you might think. Supposing we have Newton and Galileo at the North Pole, and we tell them to travel south in different uh, directions, but at exactly the same speed, difficult to do, of course. Uh, eventually, of course, they reach the South Pole if they've traveled at the same speed. Now, if they understand the Earth is round and that they've traveled in straight lines on this round surface, there's really no mystery. It's obvious they're gonna meet at the South Pole. If, on the other hand, they thought the Earth was flat and they plotted their trajectories, um, they would have, thought, well, hang on, we started off moving apart, we followed straight lines, we, well, we tried to follow straight lines, but actually we met again. And so clearly the trajectories we took weren't straight. Why weren't they straight? There must have been a force bending us back together, a force attracting Galileo's Newtons. And this is the paradigm shift from Newton to Einstein. Newton said, you don't travel in a straight line if there's gravity because there's a force acting on you. Einstein says, well, actually you do. It's just you're traveling through space and time, which doesn't look like what you think it looks like. It's, it's bent and curved. And in Einstein's gravity, space and time is bent and curved by the matter that sits within it. The sun deforms the space and time around it. The earth executes a straight line motion around the sun it's a straight line, but in this curved space, and the resulting motion is an orbit. And it looks very much like Newton's force law of gravity, unless you're moving fast or the object is very massive. And Einstein wrote down probably one of the most beautiful equations that there is that describes our physical reality, which is the Einstein equation, which describes precisely how space and time curvature is related to the matter and energy within it. It's, it's I think, it, I mean, Aesthetically, it's a nice looking equation, I think, but it's an incredibly, incredibly powerful and beautiful statement about how space and time work. And the consequences are remarkable. Space and time aren't absolute at all. They're dynamical. They get bent by the matter within it. We also have remarkable predictions, black holes, singularities, the Big Bang. Let me, let me come to some of these topics. Space and time is dynamical. It bends. Um, it bends on account of the matter in it, as we've said, but not only does it bend, but it has its own intrinsic dynamics. So even if we set the matter and energy to zero, uh, space and time can still bend. What is that bending? Well, it's ripples. Like the surface of a pond, if you put a big object into the surface of a pond, you disturb uh, or, or, or drop, drop even a stone into the surface of the pond, you disturb it. Even when the object is gone, it's fallen to the bottom of the pond, it's not there, those disturbances carry on. They propagate out as ripples or waves on the surface. And it's exactly the same with gravity. If you have a pair of massive objects, black holes, for example, spinning around each other, they disturb space and time so much that they send out big, sizable ripples in the space and time. Those Ripples can then travel, they travel at the speed of light through space and time. So space and time itself is a dynamical thing. It can carry these ripples through it, which is remarkable. Most remarkable is that um, a few years ago, you've probably heard in the news, these ripples were actually discovered for the first time. They were discovered by essentially looking for ripples in space time. You, you have a very sensitive detector that measures distances between things on Earth, and if those distances change a little bit, uh, it may, well, if there is a, a, a ripple in space and time traveling past, those distances will change a little bit. And um, by uh, 
by measuring inc with an absolutely astonishing precision. I mean, it is astonishing the ex the, these experimental um, apparatus that they have, the so-called LIGO uh, laboratory in, in the US, reached astonishing precision of measurement, isolating all the other possible sources of uh, displacement between objects, vibrations, seismic noise, um, thermal effects and so on, so that they could see for the first time, they got sensitive enough to see an actual ripple in space-time come past, and by analysing the ripple, they could see that actually it came from a pair of black holes. Because we understand Einstein's theory, we can predict what the ripple should look like, and in detail, it really looked like that. And the pair of black holes, most remarkably, that formed these ripples that were, were observed a few years back, lived a billion years ago. The, the ripples have travelled for a billion years, over a billion light years of space. They reached us, and we saw from those ripples uh, a few tenths of a second of a sort of cosmic drama where two black holes, each one many times more massive than our sun, about 30 times more massive each, were orbiting each other something like uh, 70 times a second uh, by the end. So uh, they, they, they were orbiting, they, they've probably been orbiting for millions and millions of years, but in the end their orbit degenerated because they were losing energy in part to these ripples of space and time. And as their orbit degenerated, they got closer and closer and faster and faster. And we could just see the end stage of this. That was the limit. That was when the, the biggest waves were given out and they just reached the sensitivity of our detectors. And we saw the final stages of two black holes, each 30 mass masses of the sun, coming together almost at the speed of light and colliding to form, uh, well, actually what turned out to be an even bigger black hole, which then settled down rang down uh, over a few t tenths of a second or, or even less and, and then was invisible to us, was no longer giving out any radiation. Absolutely astonishing. In that, you know, tenths of a second, the amount of energy given off was the amount of energy you would get by taking three of our suns and then converting them into pure energy through E equals mc squared. And a few a few uh, grams of matter uh, give you essentially a, a, a nuclear bomb. You know, something like a kilogram is, is roughly uh, what's uh, converted uh, of order a kilogram or, or, or tens of hundreds of grams of matter is converted to pure energy when an atomic bomb uh, blows up. This is the equivalent of three times the mass of the sun in a tenth of a second being given off by that same uh, E equals mc squared formula. So it was, it's a colossal event, it's unimaginable. But perhaps most interestingly is that space-time is a real dynamical entity. It's not a stage, it's not this absolute setting of Newton, it's part of the story, it's part of the dynamics. Um, now black holes are these remarkable objects. If you put enough matter into a small region, it, it gets so deformed and bent that light can't escape and it sort of rips uh, space and time apart. Uh, you have what's called an event horizon, which you can't return past if you, if you reach it. Uh, much like a river uh, approaching a waterfall, if you have a finite speed, and we all have the finite speed of light, but in a river you have the finite speed of uh, the speed of which you can swim, um, if you wander around upstream where the river is going slowly, everything's uh, fine. But if you stray, if you stray too near the, the point where the river reaches your swimming speed, that's it. And a black hole is very similar. The event horizon, nothing happens at the event horizon, but it is this ultimate point of no return. Nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. And uh, these black holes are the most incredible objects. This is the formula, um, I, I will be testing you on later of course, this is the formula that describes the black hole it was, it, that live out in our universe. It was discovered by Roy Kerr um, not that many years ago, um, sort of in the 70s, and it's, it's you know, it looks, a, it looks a bit complicated if you're not used to looking at formulas, but fundamentally it's very simple. This describes the space and time around a black hole, and the fact that we can write it down on one slide is remarkable. 
all black holes in our universe, provided they're not doing anything, you know, stuff isn't falling in or, or whatever at that particular moment, are described by this formula, we think. Uh, and that's, that's a remarkable statement, and it took many years for people to really understand and, and mathematically prove that, but it is nonetheless true. This is it. This is what a black hole is to a theoretical physicist. And I, I think, uh, you know, it's remarkable. Their physical reality, you know, we've seen them through gravitational waves. We've seen them more recently with the Event Horizon Telescope by direct imaging. On the left is a direct image of um, M87, a supermassive black hole at the centre of, of a galaxy. This is thought to be billions of times the mass of our sun. This is a big black hole, uh, not just 30 times the mass as in the gravitational wave discovery event. But, uh, but rather really, really a supermassive black hole, billions of times the mass of our sun. And what we're seeing here is stuff falling into it. And uh, that gives us a, a chance to sort of measure the space and time around the black hole, get a handle on that. These are directly observed, they're really there. And they are, you know, mammoth, colossal, unimaginable objects from my perspective. And yet, that's what they are. And I, th I think that's, uh, it's very difficult to sort of square this beautiful and simple mathematics with the reality of what a black hole is. And I think that's why uh, one of the pieces I found absolutely beautiful in this, in this time uh, uh, exhibition was this black hole work of uh, Makuchi. And, um, and I think, uh, who has some beautiful depictions of black holes, and I think this Again, this idea of trying to comprehend what a black hole is from the mathematical aspect or from the human perspective, from the artistic perspective, is, is just fascinating. It's, uh, they, they, are the, they are the most remarkable objects uh, that are known to us, I think. Um, they have an event horizon whose size is given by their mass. So for a, for, for a black hole the size of the sun, it's a few kilometres across. And uh, in fact, um, this is the most help of my PhD students. This didn't really happen, by the way. If this had happened, we'd all be uh, finished, including uh, Burial College and Cromwell Place. Uh, the, whole, the whole lot would have been sucked up. But, but uh, black holes have a beautiful property. They actually act like a lens. They bend light in a very interesting way around them. Um, and the size of this uh, event horizon is governed by their mass. There's a nice formula for it. If you were to fall into a black hole, um, you would reach what we call a singularity. Uh, once you're inside this point of no return, the event horizon, you are inevitably crushed uh, at a, at a, to a zero size at a singularity. And this is one of the most mis misunderstood, well, not misunderstood, uh, one of the most mysterious aspects of these beautiful formulas back here. These, um, this, uh, this formula predicts there is a singularity. It's, it's there in the formula um, and uh, there's no escaping it. Uh, once you're inside the black hole, uh, you inevitably get crushed. It's, uh, the singularity uh, is often thought to be a sort of point in space-time, but that, that's a misconception. It's more a place to your future. So once you're inside the event horizon, your future is different than if you were outside and your future is that you will be crushed inevitably. Uh, now, our mathematical understanding uh, at the pure classical level is fine at a singularity in principle, but once uh, we include quantum mechanics in that, the singularity is a place where physics breaks down. We know inevitably that our, our laws of, of quantum uh, matter don't hold once we get close to a singularity. Um, so singularities are remarkable. Now, of course, if singularities were only in black holes, we might think, well, perhaps they're not such a big deal. But of course, general relativity also gives us cosmology. Einstein's theory tells us that matter makes the universe expand and running the clock backwards tells us that the universe seemed to start at a singularity where the universe was extremely small and has been growing since then from this extremely small start. We certainly know that it was many, many, many times smaller than it is today, um, thousands of times smaller than it is today. We know that absolutely for sure. And we believe it was uh, even you know, vastly smaller than that. So essentially, the universe seemed to start in some form of a singularity. And 
it is for that reason that we would like to understand singularities. Understanding what happens if you fall in a black hole, if you have that mishap, is interesting, but really we want to know why did the universe start? What was at the beginning? And it seems to require us to understand singularities. So if we want to understand our origins, and this human idea of understanding our origins is, is very deep, um, if we want to understand our or origins, we're forced to understand singularities. And that leads us to this new era of physics. If we want to understand uh, dynamical space-time, it should be governed by quantum dynamics. And a quantum dynamics of space-time is what I call a quantum theory of gravity, quantum gravity. And that should be an unambiguous and complete theory that describes space-time, all the matter in it, at a quantum level. So general relativity is a classical dynamical theory of space and time. Space and time is dynamical, but classically, that's what classical gravity is, but really near a singularity, we've got to do better. We've got to include the quantum mechanics of space and time, quantum gravity. Now, we, I would claim, and I think this is a conservative claim, but it is reasonable. I can certainly justify this claim. I would claim we don't have a single theory of quantum gravity that is well understood at the mathematical level at the moment. There's a, there's a number of candidates, um, and of course people working on it, any of those candidates are very keen on their candidate theory and think that it probably is the way the world works. I think it's terribly naive. I think uh, even in the best mathematically understood candidates, and, and, and in my opinion they come from string theory, um, the mathematics of how quantum space-time works is very poorly understood. And whether those theories describe our universe uh, is, 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 uh, is, is well beyond where we, where we understand at the moment. So the challenge at the moment is not to describe our universe and its quantum space-time, the challenge is a more basic one, to describe any quantum space-time uh, at, a, at, a, at a sort of rigorous level where we really believe we've got some control of how the theory is working, and it's that that we don't understand. So a lot of people uh, criticise one theory or another for not describing our universe, but I mean it's hopelessly naive. We simply don't understand the mathematics of quantum space-time in any setting, um, and until we do that, really, uh, this looking for a theory of everything is a little bit premature, I think, if we're honest. We don't even understand what the possibilities are. We don't understand how many mathematically consistent descriptions there may be of quantum space-time. It may be that there's only one, that's our universe, or it may be there's many thousands, many millions, billions, I infinite numbers of quantum theories um, of space and time that are mathematically consistent, and then it becomes uh, an observational question, well, which one describes our universe, if, presumably, if one does. Uh, but at the moment, we don't have a single one that we understand well. If we had one that we understood well, a, an important question would be, is there another one? Have we just stumbled on the only one that is consistent uh, by pure luck, or um, are there others? Um, we have some clues. We do understand how to make the, these ripples in space-time quantum, and we believe that there is a particle called a graviton, which is this quantum ripple of space-time. But this, uh, whilst we can, uh, whilst we believe that these graviton particles, these quantum ripples, are, are, are will be there physically. We can't see them currently, but it, it's pretty reasonable to assume our theory uh, works for those. It's not a complete theory. If we try and look at processes that involve very high energies. Um, gravitons uh, scattering, for example, at very high energies, we are pretty sure those theories all break down. And what is the scale that determines where our theories work to currently? It's the quantum gravity scale. And actually, you can, you can figure it out very quickly using the equations I've already written down. Uh, there's this classical size of a black hole. Um, I'm turning into my physics uh, <laughs> lecturing role here. Here's our classical size of the black hole that I wrote down before, the size of its horizon. And here's the fundamental limit on how well you can know where a massive object is from quantum mechanics combined with special relativity. And if you ask, well, when does a black hole horizon become fuzzy? We equate these two, and that gives you a new scale. It gives you a, a mass 
at which a black hole starts to look fuzzy. And it turns out it's, it was discovered by a brilliant physicist called Planck um, at the turn of the last century. Uh, and Planck wrote this down as an interesting and fundamental constant. It's absolutely tiny. It's this number of meters, there are 35 zeros there. Uh, you know, this is the size of an atom, proton, smallest scales that we've ever probed. It's well beyond anything we've ever seen or probed. It's very far off. And um, for that reason, uh, observations of this quantum space-time scale are currently way beyond uh, anything we're capable of uh, in, a, in a sort of lab setting. Uh, but of course, if the universe was this small, there's some hope we might see hints of this from cosmology. Uh, we believe the universe may well have been, or probably was, that small. Um, but, uh, of course, looking back to that epoch is, is not easy. Now, um, I'm going to finish off with uh, a, <laughs> what a, a, a brilliant uh, colleague of mine once would have called a bamboozling. Uh, I'm going to come on to the most modern ideas, and I'll, I'll just sketch these very quickly. So what I've presented is a pretty classical theory of uh, space and time. We, they're dynamical under Einstein. We understand quantum gravity has to kick in at some point, but we don't really understand what that is. And I'm going to tell you one possibility for what quantum gravity looks like. And it's remarkable. It's the idea of what we call the space-time holographic principle, that actually the fundamental description of space-time, dynamical space-time, doesn't live within the volume of the space-time. Normally when we write down a, a physical theory, we write down a physical theory that, uh, that governs the physics of the volume that it describes. It's sort of obvious. But it turns out that for gravity, for space-time, dynamical space-time, the theory you should write down doesn't live in the volume that it occupies. It seems to want to live on the boundary of that volume. And this fundamental description lies on the boundary of the volume, and the interior of that space-time isn't really fundamental at all. It's what we call an emergent phenomenon. It's not a fundamental reality. The fundamental description is of a boundary, a theory on a boundary. The space-time in the interior emerges from that, a little bit like a hologram emerges from a holographic plate. Um, this came out of uh, beautiful work in string theory by uh, um, a, a very brilliant physicist called Juan Maldacena, and we don't understand it very well yet. It's actually 20 years old and many people have thought about it, it's, but it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful and very subtle uh, conjecture called the ADS-CFT conjecture. Uh, that's a bit of jargon for you. It's understood in contexts where space-time doesn't really look like our space-time. So it doesn't look like a cosmology or anything like our sort of galaxy or solar system. They, they seem to... We, we, these theories are best understood in rather Baroque settings where um, they're, they're, they're governed by some sort of Einstein-like gravity equation, but in a very exotic, um, what, what's called ADS space-time. So it doesn't look anything like our universe, but nonetheless, it does give some sort of description that seems to be mathematically consistent for a quantum space-time. So what does it look like? This funny ADS space-time looks a bit like a box. Um, so it's, it's actually, in, in some sense, got an edge. It's a bit more complicated than that, but roughly speaking, space sort of ends at, a, at an edge and time, time goes on as, as normal as in our, well, our universe, time started with the Big Bang, but uh, ignoring that, time is a sort of continuum. Uh, and so in these rather exotic settings, the space and time lives almost like it's in a box. And the box is, is fixed. But the space-time in the interior is dynamical. Here's a, here's a black hole sitting in the interior. Here's two black holes colliding and uh, forming a bigger black hole. But the fundamental description in this setting lives on the boundary of the box. It doesn't live in the interior, and that's the key idea. And it lives on the boundary, the fixed boundary. The boundary is fixed. It doesn't have any dynamics to its geometry. And therefore, it's not a theory of gravity on the boundary. It's a theory that looks like our theories of matter, these well-understood particle physics theories. And so, remarkably, in this, these theories of quantum gravity, you have a particle physics-like theory living on some rigid uh, geometry, no gravity at all, 
But that actually magically seems to describe a quantum theory of gravity that lives um, in the interior of this, uh, of this space, or rather the interior of this space emerges from this uh, description on the boundary. So space and time, as we perceive them, as we seem to inhabit them, at a fundamental level may not exist and actually may be described more fundamentally, mathematically, by some theory that is living not within the space and time at all, but somewhere else on the boundary of it. Now, what is that boundary for our universe? We don't know. We understand these theories best in these exotic settings. Um, we, we don't pretend uh, to understand them as applies to our universe. And of course, it may be that they don't apply to our universe and that some other theory of quantum gravity applies to our universe. We just don't know. Uh, what is interesting about these theories is that they seem to be mathematically consistent and allow us to ask questions uh, about how the maths works. If they did describe our universe, there's some ideas that maybe this theory, the fundamental theory that governs our universe, where the fundamental physical description lives, is at a boundary perhaps in the far future or far past or far reaches of our universe. Um, and maybe that is fundamentally where we're living. And that this space and time that we seem to perceive uh, in front of us, around us, is entirely fictitious. And we're encoded, as a hologram is, on some, if you like, holographic plate, somewhere maybe to our future, maybe to our past. It's a, it, these are remarkable ideas and they're not well understood yet, but um, uh, they're, <laughs> they're, they're, these, these are the sort of cutting edge edge theoretical ideas. Anyway, in summary, space and time uh, began with this absolute classical continuum. They're promoted to uh, a dynamical entity where space and time are linked inextricably together through this absolutely brilliant work of Einstein, special and general relativity. But uh, space and time are not uh, as we naively perceive them, even classically our measurements of them depend on our trajectory through space and time. In particular, the time that we experience between two events depends on our trajectory. It's, it's not, there's no absolute version of that, uh, of, of that measurement. Um, it depends on us and there are quantum limits to uh, our certainty about how well we can say where anything is due to quantum mechanics and special relativity. <coughs> We know that our theories break down at singularities. The beginning of the universe are inside black holes. We're pretty sure that black holes, uh, the, these classical uh, remarkable theories of space and time are right. We now have very good evidence in the last sort of five years that black holes are out there. <clears throat> We've seen them experimentally. It's, it's absolutely remarkable and they're incredible objects, but they, they force us to come to terms, and also the Big Bang forces to come to terms with our ignorance of singularities. And really to understand that, we need at the fundamental level a theory of quantum gravity. And one of our best ones tells us that space and time may simply be an illusion after all.